Hello everyone, I am here today with Scott Young. Scott is a writer, a programmer, and a traveler who writes about learning and how to get more from life. Hey Scott, thanks for being here. Ah, good to be here. Well, uh, you know, we connected a, a while ago on um, online and everything, and I was really fascinated by this, this, uh, 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 let's say this philosophy of yours of trying to, you know, become better at learning. And, uh, and I think this is something that more people need to be paying attention to. More people should be thinking about how can I learn better. And, uh, and you, what, it, what's interesting about you is that you do it through very intense experiments. And uh, right now you are around the middle of this, new ex of this experiment of doing one year with no English, traveling to four countries to learn four languages. Is that correct? Right. So, yeah, the, the current project is to try to get, you know, as close as possible to, to not speaking English um, and traveling to four countries. So uh, we're actually, we just finished the third one. So we're getting into the fourth one right now. We were in Spain. Uh, this is uh, myself and a partner. We're uh, in Spain for three months, uh, Brazil for a little less than three months, and China for three months. And now we're having a little break here in Taiwan before we go on to Korea for the last three month uh, installment. So Spanish, Portuguese, Chinese, Mandarin Chinese, and Korean are the four languages. So uh, that is that is insanity to me, and, and I, I'm sure it was being it must be very fun. Uh, how, yeah. what, so far, what what have what have been the results? Are you does this work? Well, in terms of like in, in terms of learning the languages, I think that we've done fairly well. I don't want to you know I don't want to speak uh, brag too much about it. I think that if you are interested in seeing like you know actually want to see examples of how far we got in these languages. And if you go to my website, uh, there's we did videos of it, and there's so we have I have documented it. So I don't want to be talking myself up too much, but in all of the languages that we have, I think we're at a decent conversational level. So having a conversation, being uh, functionally fluent in, in those languages, um, there's still obviously extra levels of mastery to go. Three months is not going to get you there. But I think in all the countries we're in, when we talk to other people who've been learning the language, they're often very surprised that we'd only done it in such a short period of time because uh, for most people, the level that we were getting was something that maybe you'd get after a year or maybe two years. And when we were, uh, when we were in terms of the, the no English rule, um, we did uh, very well for that with Spain and Brazil. With China, we had some more difficulties maintaining that. It's uh, going 100% Chinese uh, from, the, from day one is, uh, as you can imagine, a little more difficult. But I think we were still largely successful on that. Um, you know, even if, even if we weren't, uh, weren't perfect, I think we still used it to a certain extent to, to help us learn Chinese faster. Right, and, and I'm, my guess is before you jumped you know, in, on the, in the plane to, to travel, you had, uh, you defined what you wanted to accomplish very specifically. Like, I, I don't think, I'm, my guess is it wasn't, I just want to learn Spanish because that may be, like you said, too broad. I saw the videos and your Spanish was incredible for three months. I was really impressed. And uh, I was like, oh my God, this actually works. This was great. And what, what was your, um, target performance level, let's say, it. let's put it that way. Well, in all of the countries, the kind of idea I had in my mind before going to it and learning was I wanted to be able to have conversations with people without too much difficulty. And this is not an arbitrary goal. I feel that it's, um, there are a lot of goals you could have with fluency, but I think it's one of the most important ones because first of all, it's, it is a fairly achievable goal. I think having a conversation is an easier step than a lot of other steps in languages that maybe if you haven't learned languages, you don't realize or like, uh, for example, being able to watch a movie or TV show without subtitles and get everything that's being said, in my opinion, is a much harder goal than having a conversation because you need to have a much larger vocabulary, you need to be recognize things much more quickly. It's like if you didn't understand something, you can't get someone in the movie to explain it to you in a different way. Um, whereas in a conversation, naturally, the person is going to sort of adjust their speaking to you're going to get a communication rhythm. You're going to have the context of what's going on. So I felt like it's, it is an achievable goal. It, it's an intermediate goal as opposed to an advanced goal with learning a language. And second, once you get to a level where you can actually just have a conversation in the language, 
then now you're at a point where you can make friends that don't speak English potentially and it's no problem. You can just have them as friends. And if you want to continue practicing and continue improving the language, it's much easier to work with that as a base. If you're not at a place where having a conversation is still difficult, then it's a lot harder to get to a point where you can, uh, where you can, where improving the language happens automatically. Like you, for example, Carlos, your English is fantastic, and you with me right now are practicing. And if I used a particular word you hadn't heard before, maybe maybe you don't need to know it to understand the conversation, but you're going to think about that word and you're going to remember it the next time someone else uses the word again, and you're going to learn that automatically. Whereas if you're at a point where us having this conversation is very very difficult, right. then you're right. you're still going to be. Well, but I need to get back to the textbook and study and right. do those kinds it, it of things. Kind of, like one, that thing that stands out will kind of get lost in the you know bubble of like a bunch of things I'm not getting, I'm not understanding. Well, if I right. know most of the things, one thing that I don't understand, that I'll be able mm. to you know look at it and 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 retain that uh, so I can you know uh, figure it out later or. So conversational, conversational, maybe not fluency. Fluency, I don't like using that word too much because. It has a lot of connotations from non-language learners that mm -hmm. I find is somewhat unfair. When you say, oh, you're fluent, then they, they mind native level ability in the language, which is actually quite rare. Like there's right. actually not that many people that speak, unless they live in the country for like decades or more, um, speak it to that level. But if we're talking about conversational adequacy, conversational fluency, I think that um, that is an achievable intermediate goal, and it is a goal that once you achieve it, there's actually strong benefits from reaching that particular level as right. opposed to, you know, I know my phrasebook stuff and I can get around. Well, but I think that the conversational fluency is an important milestone. You know what stands out to me when you're talking about how you learn and like your goals and everything? It stands out how clearly you, for you, a language as a skill, it's a lot of sub skills. You, you broke it down in so many. Uh, different things and I think most people that try to learn something new um, they don't do that work of okay what how many little skills is this big skill uh, composed of and you have that sort of uh, um, uh, it's very it's clear when you listen to you it's clear that you understand you can be good at this little thing but not good at this thing and that doesn't mean you you, you know and you still qualify as you know being a, a you know Spanish speaker or, or whatever um, let me let me ask you. Do you have like habits or like what are your daily habits or rituals or little tricks and hacks for memorizing or retaining uh, things that you do um, in order to maximize the 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 uh, like, you know language acquisition process while you while you're there? So it's really interesting because I found a, a big difference in my methodology that or <laughs> methodology. A big difference in what I needed to do in order to learn the language uh, in Spain versus in China, for example. So I think part of it comes from where is your background and where are you coming from in there. With Spain, for example, I found it fairly easy to just, you know, there's an initial hump, but once we got into just not speaking English, that made the big difference. So it was mostly an immersion thing. It was you know, just watch, try to watch things in, in Spanish and read books in Spanish and talk to people in Spanish. And that in and of itself, you'll, you'll pick up a lot of things. And I did a little bit of grammar study because Spanish has some grammatical difficulties that English doesn't have. But other than that, it was like, I didn't, I didn't spend a lot of time memorizing vocabulary lists. It would just be like, oh, how do you say this? And, you know, no, don't worry too much about memorizing it because if through use, you're going to learn it that way. So that was my experience in Spain. And in China, I found, I don't think that there's, you know, it's not like China is a different kind of language. You can't learn it that way. But I found that that initial kind of hump period, which, you know, was first little <laughs> bit and then you're over it and you're into it. That was, uh, that was much of the, the time we were there. And it, uh, China has some other difficulties which makes learning Chinese a bit harder. And I found that was actually a situation where breaking down the language into specific skills, doing certain types of drills, I did find that effective in China. Whereas uh, with Spain, I found it more unnecessary. And so like with China, for example, I, I spent a lot of time focusing on pronunciation in the beginning. Mm. And you can do various yeah. kinds of drills for it with native speakers to test and measure your pronunciation accuracy. And that's important in Chinese because uh, Chinese not only has a somewhat more difficult phonology, but it also has 
Um, it also has tones, and so these tones you have to learn are very foreign for someone who doesn't speak a tonal language. And so when you're, you know, the way they try to teach it to you is they'll say, well, you use tones in English or you use tones in Spanish over the course of a sentence, and I just say this is not true. I think it just works better if you just think of it as like, it's just something that you don't have in your language and you just have to learn it from, oh, from scratch. And uh, I've heard that analogy. Well, it's just like this. It's like, you know, saying the second tone is just like saying a question and it's, it's not. It really isn't. Right. Um, and you have to kind of learn to force yourself to, to recognize the tones and also to produce the tones. And I found that useful because uh, just splitting that off from the whole activity of speaking and just focusing that in isolation right. so again, again I, a sub skill right like a, a, a one yeah, part break, of it, one piece of the puzzle breaking it down and i think that's a general rule like with spain i didn't do the it, it was more holistic it was less analytic in the process of learning because i wasn't hitting those those roadblocks i wasn't hitting that much difficulty but when you do hit that difficulty i think that method of okay this skill is kind of too difficult for me to tackle head on or mm -hmm. it's too not making the progress I want to make so you break it down into sub skills and then you sort of invest in the ones that you feel you're weak in and then you can bring it back together when you're actually using it right so let me you know uh, I, I think it was a year ago or, or maybe a bit longer than that you you in some some popularity with your MIT challenge and you did yeah. Uh, you know, you learned a four-year curriculum of computer science uh, of, of the MIT in 12 months without taking classes. And I, yeah. I don't want to touch on that too much because I'm going to put some content and there's a, lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of great content on your blog about it. But my question was, in this new challenge, are you seeing patterns of how you're learning? What, what is it that you're, you see yourself in your learning about learning uh, toolbox that you see yeah. yourself using both in that you use both in MIT and that you're using in, as you learn a new language every three months? Definitely. I think the big, the big shift for me doing the MIT challenge was uh, I had never been in a position where I had to learn that much material so quickly before. Like yeah, normally in a class I found, you know, I was taking classes that were normally spread out over four months and in some cases compressing that down to like four days in or four or five days. And so you're taking, you know, if there's 20 hours of lecture, that would be, I would, you know, watch it maybe at a slightly faster pace, um, but it would maybe be doing eight, eight or nine hours of, of actual watching the lectures in one day and then eight or nine hours in the next day. So the whole course was covered in two days. And the, 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 I, I did switch, I did switch that method up into spreading it out a little bit and doing a couple courses at a time, but overall the same amount of hours invested. Um, doing the MIT challenge and just learning at that pace is something that I hadn't done before and I think what I what I learned to try to work on was you get to see you work you, you learn all the material of the course and you kind of see what is the what are the weak points I have how can I fix those weak points in an efficient way and what's the general process of learning and and I found that um, you know what you were talking about with patterns that uh, they're sort of reliably you know, okay, this is sort of the method for fixing these weak points in this class and going through it. Whereas I, I hadn't really thought about it in that level of detail when I would be taking it over four months. Right, and and in, in language, you kind of do the same approach. You in learning your language, you're basically saying, okay, what is, it, what is exactly that I'm failing at? I'm going to put some focus on on that part. Yeah, well, doing these intense projects has been interesting. I think. In some cases, they're fairly unrealistic for, for an average person because while I'm doing them with a lot of time investment, most people learning things are learning things part-time, yeah. so that it does make that a little less realistic. But mostly because I'm learning with, you know, most people are trying to learn a language aren't trying to do it in three months. Most people are trying to learn a Bachelor of Computer Science aren't trying to do it in one year. Um, you know, I, I, if I inspire people to do that and they want to follow the challenge, then I, I you know, I, I of course support that. But I think most people I talk to are, well, how can I learn a language in one year? And like, how did the three month example translate to it? And I think that doing these intense experiments is useful because when you shrink down the time spent, you have to be more serious about cutting inefficiencies from what you're learning. You can't spend a lot of time doing something that's wasteful. Um, because you just don't have the time, you don't have the luxury of, of 
carrying that on. Right. And I think with right. a lot of learning things, people get stuck in inefficient routines, inefficient ways of doing things, and it really draws out the process. But they don't notice it because their goals are fairly mild or moderate. Right. You know, I, I encounter a lot of people, you know, in Axisphere we have people that are, you know, their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, every age, and, and what you see as that stands out in the, in the, more, in the more mature, in the older uh, population is they believe they're, they're, they can't learn things anymore. They believe they're uh, sort of past the learning curve. And, uh, yeah. and even though my, my, you know, I've heard um, that it's not so much about <clears throat> uh, our brains being, you know, uh, slowing down or anything like that. We don't really lose the capacity to learn. But what we do lose, and I think you, you kind of hinted at this, is that the, the possibility to structure our context in a way that it, it's all aimed at us learning a specific skill. We, as adults, we kind of have to split it into more things. You know, when you're a kid, you know, and you have to learn to walk, there's nothing more on your agenda, really. Like, you just have to learn to walk. And you're going to do the experiment of learn to walk, and it's going to be all your focus into that. Well, as an adult, it may take longer. And my thinking, my, my question is, you know, in doing these experiments and learning uh, about learning and you know, many conversations you have with people that, you know, your, your, your readers and clients, etc., what are your thoughts on you know learning as an adult? What are, what are some of the, the the pros and cons of trying to learn when you're an adult? Well, it's interesting you say that. I don't know any research particularly on uh, declining ability to learn. I have seen some studies that show that uh, fluid intelligence, which you know could uh, reasonably be related to uh, your learning speed, does have some decline, but doesn't have. It's not. I think it's more. You know, if you're if you're quite old, then you're, you're approaching senility. Then your fa faculties reduced. So maybe if you're you know trying to get that Nobel Prize in physics, then your 20s and 30s are going to be maybe your your best years of research um, for like when you're going to make your breakthrough uh, mentally. But I think you know in terms of a normal person wanting to learn uh, normal things in a normal pace, I, I really doubt that that's the case. It, part of it to me maybe is also that people get in a routine, they're not learning as aggressively and when they get back to a learning environment they feel very uncomfortable, they're not used to that, um, people often say the frustration barrier, that sort of initial period with a new skill where it's very frustrating, you're not getting positive feedback, you feel bad about your ability and because they've been out of it for a while they don't remember that feeling and they attribute that feeling to them being, you know, mentally they can't learn anymore rather than, no, you just have been out of school for so much time and you've been working the same job which has hit a stable routine that you don't really remember what it was like when you were in school and you did feel that in school but the social pressure was that you have to do this so you just got over it. Right. And I think that's true with language learning, for example, that, uh, I, I felt from doing this, um, one of the things and the consequences of doing this, this project is that I've met other people who are also living and traveling in these countries. And, um, you know, in, in Spain, we were very good about avoiding those people and not uh, speaking English with them. But in China, it was pretty much impossible. <laughs> it, um, well, but because there were lots of people who were Westerners who had lived there for years and they didn't speak any Chinese. And then when you come there and you say, well, we're trying to do this thing where we're only speaking Chinese and maybe they see you speaking Chinese, you get a kind of sense from them that they're kind of a little bit like, uh, well, who does this person think he is kind of doing this thing? And, but I think it's because a lot of people get in their mind that, you know, for languages, for example, that no, la learning a language is so difficult, you can't do it as an adult. And if you look around you, you can find examples of people who have been there for as long as you have still don't speak the language, so it doesn't make you feel bad. And I, I don't say that language learning is easy, but I think what, what I was trying to point out is that like, you can do it in a short period of time, it's just you have to be committed to uh, this kind of immersion, this kind of intensity, this kind of getting over your frustrations and difficulties, and that's hard for a lot of people, you right. know? And, right. and well, so well, I think... Yeah, I would say that, I would say that it's not, the, the lesson for people watching shouldn't be Oh, now you know I need to do exactly what Scott is doing, but more say, okay, what kind of mechanisms and, and methodologies that Scott is using to accelerate his learning, I can use to accelerate my learning in my you know uh, current lifestyle, uh, uh, and sort of try to go get past that initial hump of frustration that is always going to be there as fast as possible. 
Well, I and I, I feel like the the model I use for Chinese, for example, like I didn't feel uh, like I was spending a lot of time learning Chinese. It was very intense for me, and uh, it was a lot of work. So I'm not I'm not trying to say that you know everybody you know you have a full time job and you're using English for your job that well you should be doing what I'm doing because you can't always. But I think uh, I think the difference is that. Uh, for, especially for language learning as an example, but I think for most subjects it can generalize to that there's this initial period, especially before you get kind of a lower conversational fluency, um, there's this initial period where having a conversation with someone is actually painful. It's painful to have that kind of like, okay, I've got my Google Translate and I'm, like, I'm using it to fill in every second word that I don't know in the conversation. and and the person is speaking to me very slowly and we have to like, I have to sit and think for like 15 seconds for like a basic word. And uh, it's very painful to, to have that experience. And so they back off from that and they do something else. They're like, well, I'm going to get Rosetta Stone or I'm going to do some sort of little trivial thing to make it make me feel like I'm learning the language and making progress. Without putting myself in the fire of so learning. Without going, through that, without going through that hurdle. And I found that e e even if it is possible to learn a language to fluency without going through that hurdle, that hurdle of like, you know, being in this awkward situation where you're really struggling and, and you're having difficulty focusing and doing those kind of things, even if it's possible, um, it's, it's certainly far from the most efficient thing. Right. And I think that, um, you know, even, even as, a, as, a, uh, as another example, like it's not even just conversation. I know some people are really big on well, they watch TV shows and movies and stuff, and that's how they break into the language. They don't start with conversations. And uh, I haven't tried that method myself, but there could be some merit to it. But even in that case, I think <clears throat> what you're doing is you are, you're spending time listening and you're not understanding and it's difficult and it's not really that fun and you're doing a lot of it. And so I don't really think there's a way around it. I think you can do this other approach, but it's, it's 10, 15 times slower then you know you you just dive in and you start doing this and it's really difficult and it's painful but then you get through it right yeah uh, the reason i believe that your your whole body of work is so interesting and and uh and important is because i believe that in today's world we're facing this sort of new paradigm where we will all have to update ourselves professionally and learn new things as in an, as a, an ongoing basis i don't think we'll be able to say Oh, you know, I'm a lawyer, so I'm gonna be this, this. This is it. This is me. Whatever I am right now is gonna be what all I'm gonna need. I have all the skills I need for the next 50 years. I think that it used to be like that. But that's that's over. And uh, the the capacity to learn new things over and over as a skill is gonna be uh, very important. Um, so I, I this is why I think you're you know uh, um, talking with you was gonna be is, was so important because it's. You're, you know, for you, it's an experiment. And the language, of course, is, is sort of a, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like it's more a, a byproduct of a bigger uh, skill you're developing and a bigger body of knowledge you're developing. It's not about learning the language per se. That's more of a, you know, a good positive yeah. consequence of your whole experiments. Well, I, I'm very, I, I, I think you're, you're, you've hit the nail on the head that my, my big interest I am interested in all the things I'm learning about, but I'm interested in lots of things. It, it makes it easier to do my job. But, um, but my, my real sort of core interest, the thing that I'm, I'm trying to improve, the thing that stays the same, um, is learning about learning, uh, both through experience and also through trying to read as much research as I can and, and trying to work through examples with students in my course because I know that I'm not a typical person. So something that works for me maybe doesn't translate to, to everyone. So I also try to work with students in my courses and figure out, okay, yeah, but I have this idea that this works. Does it actually work when the students implement it? So from sort of these three basis points, I've been trying to, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm continually doing it. It's not a finished product. It's not like I'm an expert right now and I've learned everything there is to learn, but I'm really trying to learn my own learning methodology and trying to learn, you know, what does the science say? What works for other people? What works for me? and tying that together. And I think uh, on your point about this shifting paradigm of the world we're in, I think a really good book to learn is by GMU economist uh, Tyler Cohen, uh, Average is Over. I don't know if you've read it. Uh, how about um, I don't know which one you're talking about. But it's, yeah, it's a great book because it's, it outlines from you know, um, an, an economist's point of view why the world is changing 
and uh, mostly by the rise of automation and machine labor, but I would also argue by the rise of emerging economies like yep. Latin America, Asia, you're increasing the total amount of people playing the game. Like before it was in North America and Western Europe were a, a bulk of the economy in knowledge work. And now you're going to be, if you're doing programming job, you're not just competing against people in English speaking countries, you're competing against someone in India or right. someone in China. And when you add all those extra people there and some other changes to the outlines, we're entering a world where um, the, and, and there's some downsides to it. I'm not saying that it's universally positive, but it's just the reality of it that we're entering a world where the, the differences between being mediocre at something and being the best at something are getting magnified. Yeah. The person that's going to chug along and not really like, yeah, I'm just going to work in this job and keep my head down and not really, you know, learn what I have to, but it's going to be pretty moderate. They find themselves not being as competitive right. because, uh, and I get this from emails from a lot of people that, for example, software is a great industry where, you know, there's people and they're, and they're just like, you know, every every few years, there's just completely new technologies, completely new tools, and all these new people are learning it and becoming experts at it very quickly. Yeah. And they feel that pressure. They're like, "Well, I've been doing this for a long time. What I know should have relevance." And the pace of change is just going up so much. And I think that knowing how to learn, how to learn quickly, how to stay on top of of changes that are happening in your industry is going to be increasingly important. And so I, I've really kind of carved out my sort of little spaces, trying to figure out, um, you know, what's what are the best ways of doing that in practice? What's the practical realities of trying to learn as as quickly as you can, and where the constraints around that, and what's the sort of mindset and methodology you need to use? Yeah, I, I listen. I, I I completely agree with what you just said, and I always say that you know, internet has a price. Sure, we all have free information and. We, you know, we're all so connected, but the price of that is pace of change has accelerated, and now every every little discovery, every little new value proposition immediately becomes, uh, you know, ubiquitous, and everyone can have access to it. So the price of that is you need to move faster, and um, yeah. which is why I say that I think I really think, and you know, we started to see it sort of individuals in blogs and and, and books and things like that, but I do believe that the whole concept of education for adults. Uh, uh, platforms and places and, and um, systems for people that are out of traditional uh, education to keep, you know, learning and keep updating themselves. That I think is a, is a nation and very um, uh, interesting market uh, uh, because you know people are going to need. It's it's not easy to do all this on your own. Uh, to you know to to people we're all going to need more and more help. And uh, some of us, I guess, we 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 kind of catch this. Quickly enough to that, I guess at this point we kind of know who to talk to depending on the problem. But what we do know is that no way I'm going to be able to be to know everything by myself, and I'm going to need help. Um, and and I think that this is sort of this new uh, uh, paradigm, which to me is very exciting. But but like you said, if if you for those that kind of want to you know push it away and and believe you know assume that it, you know, just you know ignore this happening, I think the consequences can be pretty bad. Um, so uh, Scott, just you know, I do I do want to wrap up with a, one question of something I read on your blog. Um, that was a, a fascinating question. I, I love this this little uh, this, some of your posts are really good. And you asked, I wanted to know what is your conclusion after you asked what things are worth knowing well and what things are worth knowing poorly. Yeah, no, I asked that question because, and the way it was one of those things that. Um, I originally asked the question, what, which things are worth knowing well? And it, sometimes I'll ask a question, I'll have a particular model for how the question works, and you get answers, and you know, the people who are thinking about the question are thinking about it the way that I am. So I tried to, I tried to phrase it in that way, um, because to me, there's, there's different payoffs for learning things. There's things that if you reach a certain level of adequacy, poorly maybe isn't the best way, but learning something adequately, you get a bulk of the payoff. And then there's other things that, you really, in order to get the payoff, you have to be reaching a very high level. So a, a good example would be what I'm doing right now, which is learning these languages, versus maybe someone who's doing PhD in something, or they're trying to get tenure as a professor. And what I'm doing is I'm learning something, you know, adequately in a short period of time for more or less personal reasons. There's going to be maybe some business or uh, professional consequences of the languages I'm learning, but it's not... Um, me being extremely good at Spanish versus being okay at Spanish 
there's going to be some difference in the payoff. I'm not saying there's no benefit to being coming right. fluent, right. Uh, but considering how much more work it takes to become perfect in Spanish versus just getting to this level is, uh, I don't know whether there's, um, you know, the payoff, m much of the payoff just comes from this level. Whereas if you're doing, let's say, PhD research or even just what we were talking about where I'm talking about my investment and in trying to know more about learning, that if you're going to be buying a book that's written by someone on topic X, then why get it from the person who's number three? Why not right. read the first person? And so this, this leads to, you know, most of the benefit comes from learning something very, very well, not learning it okay. And I think that kind of dynamic also changes how we look at learning things and, and how we're doing things. Is this something that I'm learning that I need to learn to adequacy to, to continue what I'm doing? Or is this a core skill that I need to master in order to really reap the rewards? Yeah, this is the question that people should be asking themselves before they jump into a skill. And I agree with you. You know, a lot of times we say, oh, I want to learn this because we have some sort of romantic idea of what it looks like uh, or what it might be like to be able to do it. But we ignore... I, and I, I, do, I think we do ignore it because of pre previous, uh, because of not doing some research before, which I think it's a, a sort of a neglected part of learning a skill uh, to you know learn about it before you start trying to do it. Um, and uh, uh, but I you know it, it's definitely I, you know it reminds me of this post by uh, Ben Kasnoka, uh where he wrote, he wrote about the uh, things are worth knowing either know something really really be really really good at something. And know it very well, or just know, you know, just a little bit of a lot of things. But the worst situation is when you know you're not great at something that you put a lot of work in, but you're kind of in the middle. That's the worst situation you can be. Right. Well, I think, and I think it's a good example is that I think that in when we we're talking about this change in the economy, to me, this choice of which things you're going to be adequate in and which things you're going to master is a very strategic choice because I think it in a lot in a in a lot of ways how you make that choice will define your career opportunities. You can change it. I don't, it's not like it's irrevocable, but it does change the career directions that you'll go, the career opportunities that you'll face and those kinds of things. And I don't think that it's possible to make that decision perfectly from the get go. I know a lot of people that they thought it was going to be X and then it turns out to be Y that they end up specializing in. Well, you probably have seen that yourself that there's maybe people who do an engineering degree but then they work in a company and then they get into management and then they do an MBA and then they actually are not doing any engineering problems anymore, even though that was the thing that they started learning and mastering. Um, and so th those things can happen. But I think uh, it, in a broad way, people who choose to specialize in some things that are not maybe that competitive, they're not going to have that much value as a specialty. Uh, find themselves kind of in a bind later. I, I know uh, it's sort of an unfortunate thing about languages, but I, I've talked to some people that are professional translators, and they're really feeling the squeeze because, A, people don't really want to pay for high-quality translations. Mm -hmm. B, um, things like Google Translate and those kind of things are becoming, they're not that great, but they're, they're kind of close enough in a lot of situations, and they're getting better and better every year. So for you know, a career that's going to span several decades, it gets harder and harder. And uh, and this, the mark of a good translator is that you don't know that he translated it, right? It, it's right. just it's what right. the person said in a different language. So I think right. I was talking to them, and they like I was talking to one guy and really trying to get out of that that business. And that to me is someone who chose to master something to really develop a skill that. Um, you know, just for some various reasons, didn't have the best payoff. And I, I know that you can do that decision perfectly, but I do think that thinking in terms of that, thinking in terms of strategically deciding which skills, you know, if I just have this adequately, it won't hinder me in my future career versus, no, 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 this is the one that I need to be the best in. That needs to be my competitive advantage. And most people don't really think about it in that level. They just learn things because they find them interesting and yeah. just kind of end up being good at things or not good at things. They don't really deliberately think through that process. No, I, uh, that, that final thought is perfect. I, I do agree. Being strategic, this is, uh, because I want to stress it, being strategic about what you choose to be good at. Uh, yeah. And uh, taking some time to, I would say, don't fall for traditional labels for what you're good at. I think uh, how we define our proficiency um, I think is 
way more flexible than, than what we let ourselves believe. I don't think we all have to just be, well, I'm good at math or I'm good at, you know, uh, talking or I'm good at writing. I think there's much more to being good at than that. And when, you, and, you know, same as language, when you get to, in, in any skill in life, when you get when you get really good at it, when you when you look at the details, uh, the, the small parts, you realize that there's a lot of soft skills in, in almost anything. So um, uh, that, that's, a, that's a fantastic uh, uh, observation. Um, Scott, I want to thank you because this was uh, really fun. And this is something that I, will, I hope we can do again because I love talking about this. Learning about learning is one of my passions. And uh, yep. I, I, really, I really admire what you're doing. And you, know, you need to you know, keep working hard because uh, you're doing great work. Yeah, yeah, no, it was great, great to be here and talk about this with you, Carlos.